Well, it's the bowl season, and you know what's really great with the games already being played? You guys got everyone right so far. I can't believe it. It's unbelievable, like, just the, the sheer knowledge of, of college football that I know for me to get them all exactly right. And you picked the game when you play in the, in the, in the Alabama game. Always have. That's, <laughs> That's what happened. With that kind of insight to set the table, the Blue White Tailgate Show is next. Happy New Year and welcome to the Blue White Tailgate presented by Coors Light. Steve Jones, Trey Bauer, Jay Paterno. Todd Sadowski joins us later from the sun capital of the world, Jacksonville. Sadowski. <laughs> can you believe it? Yeah, we can believe Who's it. Who's okay. his agent, by the way? Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to know how this is working out, okay? <laughs> All right. We'll do it in a rotation. Next year, you go. Yes. Yes. All That's right. That's fine with me. Penn State, maybe the Turned out maybe the best one they had this year probably was San Diego State. They won their last 10 games, ended up 11-3, and three, good football team. Now there's this opportunity. How do you view this opportunity against, without question, a great brand name? I, I think it's going to be really, really interesting because I think the teams are very evenly matched. Um, you know, to me, it's like Penn State coming off three, win three losses in a row. You know, Georgia with all the craziness that's happened there. I think Jay said they had like two coaches that were actually coaching for the team. Um, one four in a row. I think it's evenly matched. It's going to be a fun game to watch. What do you think, Jay? What about this chance to show some progress, too? Well, I think the thing about, the thing about the bowl games is you get a chance to go into the offseason with some really positive momentum for your program. And I think last year, you know, Penn State finished 6-6, six and six, but they won the bowl game, and it set a whole different tone. I think that's going to be important going forward with this, with this program. Well, without question, Chris Godwin had himself an outstanding season, but he knows this bowl game is a really important step forward for the program. I think it's definitely a big opportunity for us. I, I think it's an opportunity for us to go out and, and show the type of football that we can play. You know, uh, they're, they're, a, they're a great opponent for us. You know, I think they have the number one pass defense in the, uh, in the nation, and it's well-deserved, you know. And so it's going to be a big challenge for us, but we're definitely up for the challenge. And that is Frankly Speaking, presented by the Blaze Alexander Family Dealerships. All right, here's a chance right here, uh, Trey, without question. Uh, what about the, the opportunity? Well, I mean, I think it's, if you think about, like, this, this coaching staff and this program where it is, I mean, last year, people were just ecstatic to get to a bowl game. They went to the Pinstripe Bowl. They played a decent Boston College team, had a really big win. I think this year they really want to prove something. It's the SEC, um, you know, and, and, and to me, I would be very, very surprised if Penn State doesn't play well. What the benefit, Jay, of extra practices? Well, there's no question that you get to benefit with your younger guys. And it all depends on how you organize them. If you go out and you take your younger guys on the offensive line, you scrimmage and do some things with that. Uh, I think the one thing that you got to be careful that you do do is you do get some live tackling and scrimmaging in this in these next in these practices because it's going to show up on game day if they haven't tackled in five All weeks. All right, so let's get to the update desks now. We get a lot of fan mail. This is the single most popular segment of the show. A lot of fan mail though from the Callista family. Andrew, it's all yours. Thank you, gentlemen. As you can see, no notes in front of me. You know why? That's because there's not much to this update desk. How South Injury Report looks clean for Penn State. So, given the time of the year and before the team left for Florida, I thought this was the most pertinent question. Who is your favorite reindeer? And you, you, are you talking about like the Christmas reindeer, right? Yeah. No, Chris. The Easter reindeer. What are the reindeer are there? Uh, flipper. <laughs> what are the other ones? I don't know. Prancer. Dixon. You have got to be kidding me. Dancer, dancer right? Prancer. Prancer. No, I was Dixon? about to say Garrett. <laughs> no, not Garrett. I don't know him. Wow. Um. Guys, this really isn't a hard question. Rudolph. Read the show. Yeah. There's Donald and is there a Donald? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> What's the song? I like Rudolph. You know. Like be the lead guy. Like I, I would like to be the lead guy. You know. Rudolph. Rudolph the red nose, right? Don't say Blitzen. 
but I like the name. It sounds tough, but yeah, I like that. Carl, Carl's a little different. I mean, I don't know. He's a little different. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, you're making me look stupid. You serious, Carl? Just having some fun with the guys before they left for Florida. By the way, I really like Brandon Bell's answer. Oh, okay. Uh, where does one go after that? Thank goodness Nassib can rush the passer. All right, uh, Penn State bowling by the numbers. The numbers are impressive. No, no team has ever been uh, programs on this. And Joe Paterno with 24 of those, far and away number one. They made a big deal out of Frank Beamer's 11th, and Frank's a heck of a coach. That's not even up to half of what Joe had. All right, uh, very quickly, James Franklin, on what do you expect out of Georgia considering all the changes they've had? I think it's it's hard to kind of recreate yourself at this point of the year. I do think there'll be things, you know, parts of the package that maybe they want to emphasize more than others, um, than maybe the, the, the previous coaches would have done. Um, so, yeah, you'll see a different flair. You'll see, a, a, you know, some changes there. Um, but it's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, we're going to go out there and it's going to be, uh, you know, the wishbone. Of course, this is the first time they played since the Sugar Bowl. Jay, your quick memories. Uh, Garrity, and it's I, you know, it's it just shows you the, the passage of time. The Greg son is out there returning punts and wearing the same number, and uh, but just a great, great night. And you got a call from the locker room that night. I did. I was getting recruited by Penn State. Um, after the game, I got a phone call from Frank Ganner in the locker room. Uh, I was there with all my friends and my family. The next week, I committed to Penn State. It was awesome. We'll take a look at the Nittany Lion offense next as we continue with the Blue White Tailgate Show presented by Coors Light. There were some great moments, and there were some frustrating moments for the Penn State offense. John Donovan, of course, no longer the offensive coordinator. Joe Moorhead is the OC in waiting. Meanwhile, Ricky Ronnie will call the play. So here's a great opportunity for us. Jay, I've got to turn to you. you know, Ricky Ronnie's going to call the plays in this. So the first time you went to call plays, how fast did the game go for you? Well, early in the game, you're on a script, so you're usually in pretty good shape. You got, but once you get off that script and you start getting to different situations, third downs and, and things like that, it goes, it goes awfully fast. And you just got to, if you prepare enough and you're, you're organized and ready to go, you'll be all right. He'll but be all right. with experience, how much did it slow down for you calling plays? Oh, there were times you couldn't wait for the play to end because you couldn't wait to call the next one. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how Ricky handles it. I think he'll be fine. I think working with the quarterbacks – will give him an advantage yeah. in that, you know, he can be more on the same page with Hackenberg. It's a great opportunity for him, and Christian Hackenberg has tremendous confidence in what Ricky Ronnie can do. Well, I mean, obviously his, his focus has kind of broadened around the entire offense and their execution, but I think, um, you know, he still pays a lot of attention to, to us and what we got to do to get better at always over there working with us um, in, uh, in individuals and whenever we have time to do whatever we got to do. He's always over there when he can't be. So uh, he does a great job balancing that. And you're not dealing with Texas State. You're dealing with Georgia. Let's take a look at the matchup of the numbers between Penn State and the Georgia defense. And Trey, that Georgia defense, uh, number one, by the way, when it comes to uh, the pass this year. And it's a tough matchup. No, I think it's definitely they're evenly matched. I mean, like we said in the pregame show, I mean, the last three games, I think the team's through, you know, 12 or 13 times. So, I mean, it, it's kind of skewed the, yeah. the pass defense um, statistic. Um, you, you know they're going to be good players. They're in the SEC. They've had a, a, a tough schedule. They won nine games this year. I mean, they're going to be a formidable opponent. Last year, the offensive line had a really good game against Boston College after getting some time. Is that what the hope is this time, the benefit of extra time with the offensive line? Well, I mean, I, I think so. Anytime you can practice and you can practice, hopefully they're, they're, you're practicing well, it's only going to help you. The fact is they had some time off. They've got some of the guys, their key people, uh, back from injuries as far as the offensive line is concerned. Those guys can't practice enough. Uh, meanwhile, Paris Palmer, of course, at that left tackle. He will start the game at left tackle for Penn State. Andrew Nelson was asked about the roller coaster of confidence for Palmer during the season. The biggest thing I would say is confidence. Um, offensive line, much like kind of defensive back, 
upset. You get beat real bad, and it kind of shakes your confidence. You think, oh, no, can I do this? You know, what do I have to do to improve? You start playing different than you usually do because, you know, you're afraid of getting beat. When those things start happening, you just have to resort back to your fundamentals and the things you were taught day one. How important was that, Jay, in bowl practice right away that you got back to base fundamentals? Well, I think it's very important. And, it, you know, when you even you have practice before you even know who you're going to play, so you have a chance for the coach to just say, look, forget about a game plan or a scheme. We're just going to talk about it. this is your first step, this is your second step. Here's where you got to be looking. And the other thing, too, with Georgia being a little bit different scheme than they've seen for most of the year, uh, it's going to be good for them to have some time to really adjust that 3-4. Family clothesline offensive player to watch, Saquon Barkley. What does a great running back, Jay, mean in the offense? Well, he is a very, very good running back in that he can hurt you a lot of different ways. He's an effect, He's effective in the pass game. He's a, he's really can make people miss, and he can really wears down because he's one of those guys that's a physical runner at the end of the run, and he's going to wear down in the second year if he gets to him. And how do you defend a guy like that? You've watched him all season long. You had to defend against some really good ones. Yeah, no, I mean, Saquon Barkley, I mean, you think about where this Penn State team would be without Saquon Barkley, and that's not taking anything away from Akeel Lynch. I mean, Akeel Lynch is a solid, you know, college football player. But, I mean, they would have been in real, real big trouble if they did not have Saquon Barkley um, and be able to perform the way that he did. I mean, you've got to gang tackle him. It's very, very difficult to take him down one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I expect a big game from him. All right, so let's get to Christian Hackenberg now. He is applied for evaluation by the National Football League, along with Austin Johnson. Let's take a look at the Hackenberg by the numbers. Jay, the footwork is very important to being accurate with the football. That's something a lot of people don't talk about. The footwork actually deals with accuracy. Is that the area he has to become better? Well, I think every quarterback coming out of college has to become better in that when, when they go to the next level. I mean, that's just something that everybody has to work on. But when you look at some of the things he's had to do, he's had to make some very tough throws under duress where he couldn't really set his feet. And, you know, Bill Walsh, when he was the 49ers, always wanted to practice one out of three passes uh, with the quarterback moving and uncomfortable. And I, I think that's something that he'll learn as he gets to the next level. All right, so we get to the Stocker Drive of the Week, brought to you by Stocker Chevrolet, located on the Benner Pike across from the Nittany Mall. No drive, obviously, for us to break down and look at. But, guys, what about sustaining and finishing drives? That's got to be one of the important keys to this game, Trey. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And, obviously, you know, you guys have been watching the show the whole year. You know, one of the biggest problems we've had, meaning Penn State all year, is third down conversions. One of the worst in the country. Um, we need to continue drives. We need to do better than that. I said at the last three games, if we can convert 35% or better on third down, we have a very, very good chance of winning the game. Jay, what does a, what does a quarterback like Hackenberg have to do at the line of scrimmage against a 3-4 in particular? How does he need to set protections and so forth? Well, the 3-4 gives the opportunity for them to bring an extra guy and over, give you some overload blitzes uh, from either side because it's a balanced front. And so you have to be ready to try to you know, dial into how they're playing it, see the second degree, also see the guys up front. And I think the, the key is going to be don't take losses. Now, if you can throw the ball away, stay out of second and long, third and long, and I think they'll be, they'll be fine. We saw how the Georgia defense has given up 298 yards per game defensively. The offense has been up and down. We'll talk about them in a moment on the Blue White Tailgate. A lot of great moments for the Penn State defense, led by a national award winner and first-team All-American and Carl Nassib along the way. Now they get to face a Georgia offense that has been up and down. They lost Nick Chubb in the middle of the season with a knee injury. Sony Michelle stepped in, played well. But let's take a look at the numbers, the matchup of the Georgia offense and the Penn State defense. And you can see right there, the Georgia offense only 324 yards per game. And in a lot of ways, especially in the pass game, Trey, they were rather pedestrian. Well, I mean, they were very pedestrian. And the fact is, if you're Penn State, you want to get them into third and long. If we can get them into third and long, um, you know, minimize the running game that they have. And I, I think that, that running back is a pretty good player. 
I mean, coming from a guy who was literally one of the Heisman favorites and then getting hurt, and this kid still rushed for over 1,000 yards in six games. I mean, if we can get that move to third and long, I think it's going to be a good day for Penn State. Jay, how do you handle a guy like NASA, for example? You're, let's, let's make you the Georgia offensive coordinator, which right now, <laughs> yeah. Maybe you are. <laughs> you could be right now. Uh, but, by the way, watch if you want to watch a tape, watch the Belk Bowl because he was the OC last year for that game. But how do you, how do you handle a guy like NASA? I and mean, how much does a guy like NASA feed off of Austin Johnson? Well, I think the thing about handling them is you got to move the pocket. You got to do some things. You yep. got to stay out of obvious passing passing downs. You want to be play action on first and second down, utilizing the fact that Penn State's got to play the run game. And I think if they do that, they can they can slow Nassib down because this is a team that's only given up 13 sacks the whole year. So they've been pretty careful. And I think obviously if you have to. If you have to double up Johnson inside, that's going to be massive one-on-one. -on -one. You hope that happens. Right. He's got the most favorable matchup up front of anybody. Their left side is really good. Nassib's coming off what would be their right side, and that's, that's a big plus. Nassib had a great year, without question, for Penn State. Remember, he missed the final two games and the final series against Northwestern and still racked up record numbers for head coach James Franklin. You know, I think I think Carl kind of had an aha moment. You know, I think, you know, it's one thing that, you know, you're leading the country in sacks and tackles for loss and all those types of things. And you think you're, you know, a pretty good player. But now you're going to all these national awards with all these players you hear about on TV and you see, and you're one of them. And I think, you know, he kind of had an aha moment and said, you know what, maybe I am pretty good. Well, he is pretty good, without question. Had a great year. But let's get up front. I mean, Johnson and Zettel. I mean, as a linebacker, you have to feed off of them, Trey. So discuss feeding off of them, especially in a game like this. Well, I, I think that the, the, one of the keys to the game is, is can Penn State shut Georgia down on first and second down? And when you have guys up front like Johnson and Zettel as a linebacker, you know that those gaps, I mean, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to be blocked one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it creates a lot of opportunities for yourself um, as a linebacker, and it just gives you a lot of confidence. So, Jay, how do you deal with the front seven of Penn State? You're Georgia. How do you want to deal with it? Well, I think you got to stick to the game plan that you got. And, you know, one of the things that they've done a great job on when you look at them, the one area of the passing game that's pretty strong is they, they got some quick play fakes, get the ball out in the flat, the fullback, and he gets some big plays, and you'll see that. Uh, against Penn State without question. I think if they can do that and keep those guys a little bit off balance, I think they'll have a chance to move the ball. Except the guy they like to run that to is going to be out of the game. Payne is the other fullback that is not quite the receiver he is. And so we're going to find out about that, but that's a good point. And Michelle, by the way, 10.7 yards after the catch, and they usually use him on flares. So you got to keep an eye on that. Tackling issues. Very important in this. We're going to deal with the tackling issues in a moment. Jason Cabinda knows they've got to somehow get and wrap up and keep the runs to a minimum. That comes out of fundamentals, really, and I think this time, you know, between um, last game of the season and the bowl game is really a great time to get back to fundamentals. That's what we're doing right now. You know, guys are banged up right now, getting guys back healthy, getting guys playing with knee bend, playing low, you know, doing all that stuff, and getting guys back to, you know, what we're all about. So I think this time right now is, is really crucial for that. You know, tackling across the country has not been great because you don't tackle as much in practice now. So, Trey, what about fundamental tackling? Where is the state of it? Not just at Penn State, but everywhere. <laughs> the state of tackling, in my opinion, is atrocious. Okay, first of all, you go to a high school game, you go to, you watch major college football, you watch the pros, it's absolutely awful. And I think the reason is, is because I don't practice it. I mean, you, you can only replicate something what's going to happen in the game. When you're playing a game, it's not like, okay, it's two-hand touch. you got to get low. you got to bring your feet. My college coach, Joe Serra, God rest his soul, used to say, tackling is feet and courage. And if you don't have feet and courage, you're not going to tackle anybody. And that's for an offense. You're aching to face a team that doesn't tackle well. <laughs> No, no question about it. But I, but I think the thing is, 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 what do they do with the extra practices? Are they going to get in there and, and work on the tackling? And I think they obviously will. Can I, I want to get back to something we touched on briefly earlier, and that was the, the game in 82. Jay, what was the ride back like to see what it was like, what this championship meant to the state? Well, it was a 90-mile parade, and uh, every small town had fire trucks out along Route 322, and the, 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 whole, the whole route up was was lined with people and it was it took three four hours to get back and Penn State was on the quarter system back then so the students were here right so when the buses pulled into the locker room area 
every flat surface was covered with students. It was crazy. Amazing. We will come back and take a trip into the film room as we continue after this. Welcome back to the Blue White Tailgate Show. Hope you caught all that. Coach Jay Paterno flipping over from the big time set to join me over here. Coach, I appreciate you doing that. Great to be here. Bowl games, special teams, always key, Coach. You've been a part of a lot of games. You've won a lot of bowl games. You know how big it is. Absolutely. Special teams are very, very critical. We'll take a look at Georgia. When you talk about their special teams, you talk about their punt return game. They are fantastic. They've returned three kicks uh, this year. And you're going to look at this video. And right here, you're going to see the ball has already been punted. And if you look at this line eight yards downfield, there's not one Auburn player who has gotten eight yards downfield or has gotten loose from a block. So we'll take a look at the video. Here's the punt. You see when he catches it, there's nobody around. Plenty of time to take a look, see what's going on, find the seam, get up there and get a touchdown. And that really broke the game open. And those are the kind of plays in the bowl game are going to matter. Now, we talk about defense, offense, those kind of things. We'll talk about Georgia's defense first because that's where really where they are strongest. You look at their statistics over the years, they are in the top 10 in a lot of categories. Um, and it really starts their linebackers. Their four linebackers are their top four tacklers on their defense. That's very, very unusual. They play a 3-4. You take a look at the video, you see how aggressive they are. They're all around the football. They make things happen. If they can handle your run game with their front seven, not to get the secondary involved, it's going to be a long day for Penn State. Why are they so good? They play great gap integrity. You look at this play, they're going to bring a guy in motion and run the jet sweep. You're going to see these reach blocks. 84 is going to maintain leverage. 51 is going to come up underneath and make the tackle for a loss. Those things are very, very important. The other thing that they're very good at is they play a lot of man-to-man in the secondary. They sit on routes. They don't give you a lot of places to throw the ball when they blitz. Here's a situation. They're going to run this blitz off the edge. It's a hot blitz. He's got to pick one up. Now, if their offensive line is good, they may have a chance to get back out and pick this blitz up. But because they're so uh, so fast and they press the line of scrimmage so hard in the blitz, it's tough to, to pick it up, and they don't. You take a look at the video, and you see from the wide shot, this is the uh, sideline shot, you're going to see that blitz gets there. There's nobody open to get the ball to in a hot situation, and it creates problems for the offense. The other part is how we talked about them sitting on routes. Even in zone situations, they're going to sit on your routes and force you to find, get open. Here you're going to see a situation to second down and about 9 or 10 against Tennessee. He's going to sit on this route, and you're going to watch the backside linebacker really hustle the football when this ball gets deflected and make an interception. So take a look at this on this one. You see that guy in the slot sits on him. He deflects the ball. Here comes the backside linebacker to make the play. Get a great shot over here from the end zone. And that's just great hustle. Those are the kind of plays that Penn State can't afford to have offensively. Coach, obviously a great defense they have down there at UGA. You mentioned the four linebackers. Penn State fans should love it. They are the leading tacklers, after all. We are known as linebacker U. Offensively, though, one thing all good SEC teams have is a big, stout offensive line. That's the case down there at Georgia. They have two all-SEC guys on the left side. A very good offensive line, and we take a look at what makes them good. They are great in pass protection. They don't take sacks. They only have 13 sacks the whole year. And when you look at what they do, 54 and 71 to your two all-SEC guys. 71 has flip sides, so they may be able to match them up against Carl Nassim if they want to get that matchup. But you're going to take a look at this play. Auburn's going to run a very, a very intricate twist here. 54 is going to come over and help. When we go to the video, you'll see how they help out and really protect the quarterback. Even though nobody's open downfield, because they do a great job protecting, this quarterback has the ability to take off and make something happen. And in this play particularly, he had three or four seconds to throw the football. You look at the run game. Here's a great shot of how effective they are in the run game. Again, here are their two all-SEC guys. The line of scrimmage, or the ball is being snapped from the hash. When this play happens, you're going to see them move this defensive tackle all the way past where the ball was snapped. You're going to see this guy get moved, and you're going to see a great cutback lane uh, created here for the running back. Take a look at this one. You see from the end zone. Just watch how much movement they get on the down guys. They take them for a ride, runs them right by. That opens up a huge running lane, and it's tough for linebackers. Puts a lot of pressure on linebackers when the holes are that big. And really great effort downfield on the blocks. The other way they're going to get him involved with the, the, the tailback involved in the, in the offense is through the pass game. They like the screen game. Here he's going to come across the formation. They're going to get a guy out. They beat the blitz. Take a look at the video. Even though the blitz is coming, they're able to hit off this blitz. 
get him out behind the, behind the pass rush, get people out in the open field, and you can see this guy's got a lot of ability with the ball in his hand. Much like Penn State with Saquon Barkley, they're also going to use him in the Wildcat. Here you're going to see the motion. They're going to double these guys down with that good offensive line. They're going to let this guy go, and he can't be right. And you'll see what happens on the video. They bring that guy in motion. Okay, that defensive end is unblocked. He guesses and hesitates one step. They get it to a fast wide out on the edge, pick up 10, 11 yards. And again, that shows you a lot of poise for a running back being able to make that read. Should be a great matchup of the running backs for Penn State fans to watch out, out for coach. So many things could go wrong. You got to keep things simple in these bowl games, as you mentioned earlier in the show. No question. I think for the, the more of these games are lost than won, but I think one of the things for Penn State fans to watch is going to be the effort level of the kids from Georgia with all, the, with all the turmoil and things. If they come out and play hard, it's going to be a heck of a football game. And, Coach, you've hit on about 83 85% of everything that we've done in the film room. I got to say, that's a pretty good job, right? I've been around the game a little bit, but, you know, it's a lot easier to do it in the film room than it is to do when you're actually coaching the game. It's almost like he knows what he's talking about, or we know what we're talking about here on the Blue White Delegate Show. Joining us next, Todd Sadowski from Florida. Normally when we sit in these chairs, that chair where Jay's sitting is occupied by Todd Sadowski. As we all stand around an ash can here in Pennsylvania, Todd is standing down in Jacksonville, Florida. My friend, welcome. Happy New Year. Oh, Steve, it's great to hear from you. Happy New Year. And gentlemen, uh, well, I say gentlemen, I refer, of course, just to Jay and not Steve. <laughs> what are you Trey. talking about? Uh, just, just messing with you, fellas. It's uh, great to hear from you. And I tell you what, it is great to be in Jacksonville, yeah. Florida. It's been fantastic down here all week. Well, what we're going to do, Todd, is we're going to take it around the room here. And Trey gets the first question because we drew lots and he threw, threw Jay and me out of the way because he wanted to ask the first question. <laughs> so, it, Trey, what do you got for me? Well, I, I guess my thought is, is the transition from being here in the Northeast, the, war the weather has been very, very warm down there. I know my dad lives in Florida. How, how do you think the kids have been practicing, and how do you think that they're, um, they're been acclimated to the weather? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because that's one of the first things Coach Franklin made reference to was the humidity that they felt as soon as they got off the buses on Amelia Island. Sure. And I think as it's went through the week, it's gotten a little bit better for them. They're getting a little bit more used to it. It's going to be cooler for kickoff than it was at the beginning of the week. So I think they're going to be fine. Uh, you know, look, they, they said they've been going really hard on the conditioning end of things. It was warmer when they were practicing up north, as we all experienced for our Christmas time. So I think the, I think the adjustment's not going to be too bad. Once we get through to kickoff, it'll probably be about what it was the last few days that they were in State College. So I think, I think they'll make the transition well, especially considering how hard they were going at it uh, before they left. Sure. A very important hard-hitting question for you, Todd. How many rounds have you played, and what has your average score been? And tell the truth. Well, i got to tell you, Jay, oh, my gosh, how tempting is it? They've got Penn State at Amelia Island. So as you go back, you know, it says like four miles to the Omni where they're staying. Meanwhile, you pass about 400 golf courses as you get there. And then they got Georgia at the Sawgrass Marriott. So TPC's right there. So it's definitely temptation is, is killing me. But you know what? Oh, woe is me. I couldn't get a flight out until Monday. So I'm thinking my round is going to be on Sunday. So hopefully I'll give you, I'll give you a report on the score, but I think I'm just going to enjoy getting the clubs out potentially and, and hitting the course on Sunday. I'm just betting that the first number on your scorecard after 18 is going to be a one. <laughs> <laughs> just, just throwing it out. <laughs> I'm betting the first number on my scorecard will be a snowman or the whole number one. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. By the way, when you do get back, I would like to get a full report on the drop area at 17 at the island. <laughs> well, hey, Steve, quick story on that. Last time I was in Jacksonville was covering the Eagles Super Bowl, and yeah. the media party was actually on the 17th hole at TPC, and they gave everybody one swing, and I had two guys down here with me, and the one didn't play golf, so I made sure to use his golf ball, too, and I'm happy to report I put both of them in the drink and enjoyed every moment of it, so Perfect. no big deal. Hey, what about Jacksonville? You've been there for the Super Bowl, obviously, Todd. What about Jacksonville? as a destination. Penn Staters haven't been down there since 1976, for goodness sakes. So what's, what was your impression of it then? What's your impression of it now? Well, it's a fantastic venue for college football. We've all heard the arguments about whether it is for the NFL or not, and the Jaguars have had their struggles, of course, 
to maintain the team and all that. But it's it was the stadium Everbank Field was built for college football. The Gator Bowl is the sixth bowl game ever, and we were at the stadium, and it's it's going to be great experience. Game-wise, they, they installed the world's largest video boards on both ends, 62 feet high, 362 feet wide. So the experience is fantastic in the stadium. But as you mentioned, look, this is this is a college football town. They're used to hosting college football with Jackson, I mean with Georgia, and uh, also with Florida in the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. So they're they're used to this. They know what they're doing here, and Penn State fans have enjoyed it all week long. That's right. What do you think the makeup is going to be? Uh, for the game as far as the fans. I mean, the, the Gator Bowl holds, what, 70,000, 75,000. What do you think the, the Penn State versus Georgia matchup is going to be as far as tickets and fan, uh, fans going to the game? Well, I had a chance to talk to the executive director for the Tax Slayer Bowl, Trey, and they're looking at an even split. Ticket sales are running about 50-50, which is a big change from last year when Iowa played Tennessee. They told me the entire lower bowl was all Tennessee orange. So they're expecting about a 50-50 split. We're obviously thrilled to take Penn State because they didn't have to grab a Big Ten team. But once the Nittany Lions were on their board, they, they made sure to grab them. But they are expecting a pretty even split with the crowd. I got you. Hey, uh, Todd, one other thing, just in terms of Georgia, what you're hearing down there, uh, in terms of team morale, obviously with interim coaches and all the turmoil, uh, are you getting a sense uh, of how the team is handling how they're reacting to it? Well, I mean, Jay, you've been around young guys this age for a long time. They've dealt with a lot of different things. When you hear stuff about your team and that you're not going to perform, boy, as coaches, I think that's usually what – You'd love to hear that kind of stuff from a motivation standpoint. Their morale is fine. Um, you know, I think they're all still a little disappointed about Coach Rick, obviously. And I think they want to show that, look, this is a quality team and they're full of talent. This is somewhat of a home game for them in that they know this venue very well. They're going to be familiar with it. Um, so I don't think there's any concerns on their end from that. Now, of course, you know, look, they're in a state of flux when it comes to the coaching staff. So how much that – has played into it. I, I can't really say. We'll, we'll find out at kickoff. But I think Georgia's players are ready to go, and they're anxious to prove that you know they're disappointed with the yeah. season as well as the fans. Todd, happy new year from us to you. I will see you down there, my friend. Okay, sounds good. Make it a great 2016, guys. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Todd. All right, thanks, Todd. Todd Sadowski in Florida, back with more after this. Time to talk about the dogs. That's right, Georgia. Mark Richt had been the head coach for 15 years. He won 145 games. That's not good enough. He, as Dick Girardi would say, is gone. He went to Miami. So Brian McClendon, a Georgia Bulldog through and through, is the interim coach before he makes the trip to South Carolina to be the co-offensive coordinator for one of our favorite guys, Will Muschamp, and he will coach this will be his one and only shot to be a head coach in Georgia, and uh, he gets the shot. So, an interim coach. This will be the fourth one Penn State's faced this year, guys. Well, I mean, the interim coach, I think it's, we were talking, they have an interim head coach. Yep. They have an interim offensive coordinator. Yeah. They have an interim defensive coordinator, and it's like, I think the hot dog guy is like coaching defensive backs. I mean, to me, it's like, it's got to be very disruptive for the kids, and the fact is that I think that could be a really, we, Penn State could take advantage of that, I think. And to quote John Stroh, Penn State is 3-0 on the interim coach tour this year. All right, so now we get to Brandon Bell. He knows that the Georgia offense will bring with it several challenges to take care of. Clyde most compared to Michigan State, you know, use the fullback uh, a lot in the eye formation. The run, starting running back, uh, Sony and Michelle, is really good. We feel like he's one of the better players on offense. And uh, probably going to be key to stop him. I think the similarity with Michigan State to me, guys, is just the offensive line. I think it really ends at, at that point in terms of similarities. I don't know what you guys think. They, they, they like to run out of the I formation. They, they, don't want, they don't do too many, too many crazy things, but the things that they do do, they do very well. Um, and on the defensive side of the ball, I think they're long and lanky, kind of like Michigan State. Uh, yeah. But, okay, Michigan State is <laughs> playing for the national championship, yeah. and Georgia's playing in the Gator Bowl yeah. against us. Let's give them credit because Todd Gurley gets hurt, Nick Chubb steps in. Nick Chubb gets hurt, Sony Michelle steps in. Let's look at what Sony Michelle has accomplished this year. Remember, he only started half the games. He started out the year, Jay, as the third down back and then became the A guy. Well, I think you're looking at with this guy, he and Saquon Barkley are very similar to each other 
in that they, they can both be a threat in the pass game and the run game. And they both do some wildcat things. So it's going to be really a mirror image in terms of those guys. It's going to be fun to watch those two guys play against each other. Yeah, Michelle and Godwin are the two guys that do run the wildcat in this offense, as Jay pointed out. Jason Cabinda knows they have to somehow slow down this run game and force Lambert to win it by throwing it. Their rushing attack is good. You know, they got big guys up front. You know, the offense line is very big. You know, they move well. Um, you know, Sonny Mitchell's a very good back. I know, you know, Chubb went down, but they have guys. You know, they have guys who can really run the football. And uh, something, you know, we're, we're excited about. It's, it's our style of game, you know, that smash mouth football. I think we're, we're really excited about that. Yeah, he's right about that. This is Penn State's style of game defensively. I mean, this is not an option team by any stretch of the imagination, Troy. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, the fact is that, you know, they are very, I mean, these two, two, these two teams are very, very evenly matched. I mean, the fact is they won nine games, we won seven games. The fact is they're both stout on defense. Um, the fact that, well, I mean, other than the fact that we have, all have our coaches and they have no coaches, is probably the biggest difference. But, I mean, other than that, I think they're very similar. Jay, what's to be said about a quarterback that's careful? Lambert does not take a lot of chances. How much, of, as a coach, how much do you like that? But also at the same time, how much does that take away from you? Well, I think in bowl games, when there's a lot of unknowns, I think the most important thing is more. most of these games are lost. They're not won. Okay. And I think when you have a quarterback that's careful with the ball, and I think both of them on both sides of the ball, Hackenberg's been Kim much more careful this year than he was a year ago, and the Georgia guys have not turned the ball over much, and they're both plus in the turnover margin. So, you know, I think the big thing is going to be who's more, who, who doesn't make the big mistake that costs you a game. You'll see Bryce Ramsey punt the ball in the game. I think you might see him play some at quarterback. He had won the job, actually, in the spring. Then Lambert transferred in late, then got the job. So just mark that down. Malcolm Mitchell, their top receiver. Uh, ACL a couple of years ago, good player, somewhat explosive, but Terry Godwin is explosive. He's the other guy they use in the Wildcat, and Jay, they've used him a lot more down the stretch as a, a big play wideout. Well, those guys that can beat you and get a big, big score uh, are the ones that scare you the most, and that, you know, when Penn State and Allen Robinson, they saw very different coverages than they have since because he's a guy that tilts the field and you got to put two guys on him. And if Georgia can get behind them early, that, that does change the tempo of the game. Now let's flip it to the other side. Andrew Nelson and that offensive line will have to block a 3-4 scheme. They're a very stout defense. And people could say they've struggled offensively more than, than they have defensively. Uh, but their defense is very uh, stout. They're big up front. They're big guys. Um, you know, strong, good front seven um, type guys. And, and that's that's something that as an offense we're going to have to prepare for is that, you know, that's where the battle is going to be. We're gonna, our offense is going to have to take it to them defensively because that's that's the strong point of their team. Gainus, the transfer from UAB, was actually voted by the coaches as the MVP this year. Then there's Floyd. Jay, this is an athletic defense, but they're also very long. No question. And, you know, when you look at them on film, and you see wide out screens and you see the outside linebacker and inside linebacker getting out the sideline and making those tackles. They can run and they go after it and they play very, very relentless. And I think that's going to be the key is a lot of times with interim head coach, the game doesn't start out well. There's a little bit of a lack of interest or, you know, what are we here for? And I think that's going to be what fans should look for is how hard they play. Kim rose out of this game, so the Trez Patrick probably is going to have to start. That will be his first start. Your thoughts just on when you look at the Georgia defense, Trey, what you see? Well, I think what we're going to see, and obviously you guys as Penn Staters, I mean, you're going to see a defense of 3-4 you really haven't seen the whole year. The other thing is, you know, we can talk all we want about, well, maybe they don't throw the ball as well, and um, or, or they don't throw the ball as well, but their defense is, I, I guess probably top 15 in the country. They're only giving up 16 points a game. Right. I mean, the fact is, you know, it, it is a formidable opponent that we're playing. It's almost kind of like a mirror image other than the fact is, um, I, I think for us, that with the coaching staff being intact for the most part, or it is intact, yeah. it's going to be really, really important. And Dominic Sanders leads this team with five picks, tied for the SEC lead. Now special teams. Isaiah McKenzie. Jay, you broke down the tape. Why are they so great, and why is he great at punt returns? Well, as we talked about in the film room, they are relentless in their scheme, and the guys up front hold up really, really well. So when they're catching the ball, they're catching the ball a lot of times with nobody around them. And on, on punt, that is so critical, to be able to kind of catch the ball moving forward without anybody around. And, and once they get it, they have great vision. Both guys have taken – they have two guys have taken them back for touchdowns. Kickoff returns are okay. Place kicker, though, don't look at just this year's numbers. He's 8 of 14 lifetime over 50 yards. The good, the bad, the ugly coming up next.
We call it the G block. G for good, G for great, G for go. Here we go. All right, the good, the bad, the ugly. The most angelic guy on set is Jay. He gets the good. My good is Frank Beamer closing out his yeah. Virginia Tech career with a couple of wins consecutive, even though he beat UVA, which is where I started my coaching career. But you know what? A guy that had been there for 27 years, loyal to a great to a school, created a great program there, and obviously great to see him walk out of there with a win. The bad. What is the targeting rule? Gary gets thrown out of the Foster Farms Bowl for targeting on a perfect form tackle that any coach would be proud of with his helmet to the side hitting the, him in the shoulder area. And on replay, they confirmed it was targeting. Okay. Who's wrong? The officials are wrong. Understand what targeting is before you make the ruling. Trey. Ugly. Other than the fact that, um, well, I'm not going to get into Notre Dame, but the ugly to, <laughs> the ugly to me is the administration at uh, University of Georgia. From the chancellor to the president to the athletic director to fire Mark Rick, um, basically they have six coaches coaching these kids. I mean, you promised th these kids and their families that you were going to you know, see them to the end, you were going to make them graduate, you were going to provide all the opportunities in the world for them, and for them to do what they did to Mark Rick after winning 145 games in 15 years is an absolute disgrace and is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. You know what? I I'm completely in agreement with you on this, Trey. I mean, I don't understand what are the expectations today. I know the money is greater than ever, and money plays a big role in expectations. I got that. But where's the patience? You don't get greatness unless you have some sort of long-term patience. Am I right, Jay? I mean, there's no question. Stability is the key. You look at the difference between you take it to the pro level. The difference between the Pittsburgh Steelers and Cleveland Browns. Yes. Steelers are one of the most successful organizations in all of pro football, and they have had great stability and great patience. And I think in college football, it's even worse because your impatience is impacting young people. Uh, the guys from Georgia are going through having Mark Richt as a coach to interim coaches now to another yeah. guy coming, Kirby Smart coming in. You know, you know, you've got to have some patience to let these kids, let these programs develop. This is normally the pick em segment. Uh, it should be pointed out that the three of us, along with Todd, have literally picked every bowl game correctly. <laughs> I mean, it's an unbelievable run. Unbelievable <laughs> run. So now let's talk about the fact that the semifinals were on New Year's Eve. Uh, guys, is this going to work long term to have two out of three years on New Year's Eve? No, it doesn't make any sense at all. Why? What in God's name are they doing it on New Year's Eve? I mean, the fact is New Year's Eve is kind of like a celebration of ending the year, starting the new year fresh. I mean, to me, as an old school guy, those games should be played after January 1st. For guys that are married and have wives that are, <laughs> want to do something on New Year's Eve, they're putting us in a really, really bad spot. So no thank you. I just, I, I don't understand it. January 2nd, which is when Penn State's playing, was handed to them with a silver platter. When we had a perfect day to play it. And it's the college football playoff. Actually, ESPN balked at this. And the college football playoff committee is very strong about staying on New Year's Eve. All right, keys to the game. All right, let's get to the keys to the game. And we're going to start out with uh, Trey. I, actually, I get to go first. All right. You go first. I get to go first. All right. Keys of the game very quickly. Uh, turnovers are going to be very important. Also, we talk about motivation. Georgia can talk all they want about being motivated. If they get off to a good start, they'll stay motivated. They get smacked in the mouth, motivation leaves. I, I think the key of the game is can Penn State stop Georgia's rushing game? I mean, the fact is that they've run the ball very well this year. They've got a really, really good running back. Um, and I think the key is going to be can we stop them and get them into third and longs? I think the key to this game is more of these bowl games are lost than won. As you look at the bowl games that have played out, you see sloppy plays, you see fumbles, you see interceptions, you see special teams breakdown. So the key is going to be who can come out there and play most like they haven't had a five-week layoff. Also, the motivation thing you talked about, Steve, get started early for Penn State. Andrew Kalista, Todd Sadowski, Jay Paterno, Trey Bauer, I'm Steve Jones. Thanks for joining us on the Blue-White Tailgate presented by Coors Light.